M theory, and in particular with a focus on the three-brain solution of that, of that system that we found uh, years ago with uh, uh, Andre Lucas, Dan Waldrum, and uh, Bert Overt. Uh, and then <coughs> lifting this in the case of uh, an elliptic vibration up, up, well, first of all, lifting this first of all into a solution really in 11 dimensions, which happens to actually be an exact solution for once, can be interpreted as uh, uh, three overlapping M5 brains. That's for a general Calabi-Yau. But uh, in the case of an elliptically fibered Calabi-Yau, one can actually do an oxidation to six dimensions and then reinterpret the solution uh, in the context of F-theory. And that's basically what I'm going to tell you about in the rest of the talk. So um, <clears throat> I just begin with uh, some uh, reminders about what was meant by heterotic M-theory in 10 dimensions. If you dimensionally reduce 11-dimensional supergravity on a Calabi-Yau threefold, turning on the 11-dimensional theory's four-form flux, you get uh, an eight supercharged theory in five dimensions, so that's minimal five-dimensional supergravity, coupled to a matter sector that's determined by the topological properties of the Calabi-Yau on which you reduced. So uh, overall, <coughs> the, the vector fields are determined by the, the Hodge numbers, so H11 determines the overall number of vector fields. Uh, maybe, is it possible to turn out these lights? Because I think they're getting in, in the way. <coughs> Uh, so one of the vector fields in five dimensions must belong to the, the minimal five-dimensional supergravity multiplet, but then there are h11 minus one others that belong to vector multiplets. All of the five-dimensional vectors emerge from the, the three-form gauge field in 11 dimensions in the compactification where two indices of the three-form point in the calabi yau directions. I, I should mention that this whole uh, development of, of reducing from 11 to five dimensions uh, I guess the first paper I, I know in detail about this is a paper with uh, Katowice, Zolidoria, and, and, and Ferrara back in 1995, and that was also a point of departure for our work with uh, Lucas over at Maldrum. Um, <clears throat> now, in, in the vector multiplets, each vector multiplet contains also a single real scalar, which, uh, in fact, is a kaluza klein scalar that's coming out of the 11-dimensional metric. <clears throat> and in addition to those scalars, there are four other scalar degrees of freedom that constitute what uh, one calls a universal hypermultiplet that's always there, uh, contains the last of the H11 uh, kaluza klein scalars from the metric, plus a complex scalar that comes from the three-form gauge field uh, in 11 dimensions when, when, that <coughs> when those all three indices point in the calabi direction, so that relates to a complex 3,0 form of the calabi plus one more axionic scalar that arises from dualizing the three form where all the directions point in the lower dimensions. So in five dimensions, that, act, that dualizes to an additional axionic scalar. So that's basically the content of the bosonic sector of the theory. And the universal hypermultiplet will pay, play a rather important role in what follows. Uh, <clears throat> now, I should mention that one of, one of the things that we, we've studied, in fact, in another paper with Mike Duff, uh, Sergio Faro, and Chris Pope, is that dimensional reduction on a calabi manifold doesn't, in general, produce a consistent truncation to a lower dimensional kaluza klein theory. There, there are no isometries on a uh, calabi manifold. Nonetheless, nonetheless, there's a kind of intermediate consistency that you can get in systems such as the reduction of uh, type, type 2 or 11-dimensional supergravity on, on such a manifold in the sense that if you integrate out properly the massive fields, the corrections that those produce to the lower dimensional theory are, are all of higher derivative character. So the, the reductions that we're talking about here actually fall into that uh, category that we studied with uh, Mike, Chris, and Sergio. Um, <clears throat> now, the uh, scalar fields coming out here uh, have, can correspond to a volume modulus and shape moduli. So the shape moduli basically have the volume factor uh, separated out. And uh, it's the volume factor that will, in fact, play a rather important role. It's part of the universal hypermultiplet that I just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> so you can now specialize your attention to a, uh, just a five-dimensional effective action for the bosonic fields uh, for the, the shape and volume moduli in five dimensions plus the metric. <clears throat> and uh, as I've mentioned before, this theory that we're interested in has fluxes turned on of the four-form gauge field in 11 dimensions with the field strength turned on in the calabi direction. So that requires four forms here, in fact, or two comma two forms. 
And in fact, on the Calabi-Yau uh, threefold, H22 is equal to H11. So again, these are just uh, characterized by the H11 moduli. Uh, so we turn on those fluxes, and that produces a potential in the five-dimensional theory. That potential in the five-dimensional theory, <coughs> in fact, is given here. These alphas are, in fact, the 1, 1 uh, parameters of the 1, 1 moduli, the values of them. Uh, so basically, the parameters of the fluxes that are turned on. So there's a potential in the, for the scalars in the, re remaining, in the resulting five-dimensional theory, um, which is also coupled, of course, to gravity. But uh, this potential means that the theory will not have a maximally symmetric solution. For example, flat space is not a solution of this uh, five-dimensional theory. What the theory does like, instead of flat space, however, is it loves brains. And in fact, it likes to have a co-dimension one uh, solution in five dimensions, which will be the four-dimensional world volume of a three-brain three solution. So uh, in order to uh, accommodate the harmonic function of these co-dimension one brain solutions, a harmonic function in one, one dimension is just a line, I've already included some sources here, which are basically necessary in order to produce kinks in that linear harmonic function in order to avoid the harmonic function, or rather the volume, the v volume modulus of the Calabi-Yau would run into zero and produce singularities unless you include the kinks. So the kinks can be uh, uh, injected into the solution by including source terms in the action with plus and minus signs. So one is corresponds to a brain and the other to an anti-brain, or brain of positive tension, one of, of negative tension. And in fact, this is going to reproduce a horzawa witten um, structure in five dimensions. So, um, well, it's in fact, this is a classic feature of the horzawa witten construction that you have one positive and one negative tension brain. If you want to interpret it from a string theory point of view, people talk about orientifolds. But uh, it is, in fact, necessary. To, but, but the sum of the, the, the charges has to add up to zero. So we have plus and minus. Uh, if you're worried about stability, that's another whole seminar I can give. It actually happens to be stable. So the, in the horzawa witten picture, there's one positive and one negative tension brain at the ends of a, of a one-dimensional line element in, the, in this co-dimension one direction. Yes, it, w it is. So the calabi yau reduces the supersymmetry by a factor of a quarter, so we're down to minimal supersymmetry in five dimensions. Sorry. Excuse me. Two steps. We're down to minimal supersymmetry in five dimensions because of the calabi yau and then the brain solution breaks it again by a factor of a half, so we're down to n equals one supersymmetry on the four-dimensional world volume. Uh, so... <clears throat> The five-dimensional effective action has a class of three brain solutions that I've, I've given here uh, for the metric, warp factors A and B, and here's the, the, the volume modulus, which plays a, cru a crucial role. And in fact, the other shape moduli in general <coughs> uh, are determined by the set of functions F that are determined in, in, in turn by a corresponding H11's worth of harmonic functions. And you can see the linear structure of the harmonic functions here. I've already put absolute value signs. The y is the co-dimension one transverse direction. I put the absolute value signs here in order to produce the kinks in the harmonic function in order to prevent it from running into zero. So that um, <clears throat> general five-dimensional solution involves all the, the shape and volume modulus fields. But we can specialize to a particular type of solution that involves only the volume modulus, or what one calls the breathing mode, by making these particular combinations here. And uh, that's what's called the universal solution, basically. It involves just the, the breathing mode V alone. Uh, as I've said before, we put uh, the, the sources here. Um, the one that, one of these is positive, one of them is negative. I think this, this one here is positive, that one is negative. They're necessary in order to have the uh, line element be compact and to avoid having the uh, harmonic function run into the zero value, which would produce a singularity. So these uh, uh, <clears throat> types of solutions have played a, a key role in the development of cyclic cosmological models. I know that Andre doesn't like these type of models very much, but it certainly has uh, given rise to a lot of discussion uh, in, the, in the cosmological literature. Um, let me mention about the whole issue of, of consistency. Providing the overall volume of the calabi threefold remains small, so that the mass gap between Kaluza-Klein levels is large, 
The lack of a, com a completely consistent truncation from 11 to 5 dimensions can be ignored uh, because the mass gap will be there. Now, <clears throat> there's one question that's been raised about, about such solutions, which is whether they can avoid falling onto, into the singularity when you consider time-dependent solutions, generalizing the static one I just showed you. And in fact, as sh was shown by Chen, Chong, Gibbons, Liu, and Pope, you can actually uh, promote the solution I had on the previous slide to a time-dependent solution by having the constant, ad additional constant here become time-dependent by just a linear t uh, term in time. But then you can see that there is, in principle, a problem because for any value of k, there will be some time at which this harmonic function will vanish. And that, in fact, leads you back into danger with the um, singularity. But in fact, a, a detailed an analysis of what the, the brain solution re really does, if you put any, any small amount of scalar matter on the end brains, for example, scalar field kinetic energy, causes, instead of falling into the singularity, what happens is the, is the solution has a series of encounters with the singularity where it, it basically has a point like bounce off the singularity. And this is, again, is an important feature of the cosmological discussions. Uh, so that's pretty much all I'm going to say about the applications of these solutions. We're going to go on and try to study uh, their, their mathematical properties. Now, one of the features of that universal solution is, and this I don't know if it was particularly well, well recognized, is that it actually has an exact interpretation in 11-dimensional supergravity, although the generic solutions of this uh, five-dimensional theory cannot be lifted to 11 dimensions. Some specific solutions may be, and this universal three-brain solution happens to have that property. If you look at the equations of motion of 11-dimensional supergravity here, first of all, one, if one just considers uh, this in 11 dimensions, we find that there are, uh, as Arkady Ar Saitlin has, uh, has shown us how to do, there are intersecting brain solutions for three intersecting M5 brains given here with separate harmonic functions H1, H2, and H3. In an intersecting brain solutions, the harmonic functions depend only on the overall transverse coordinate, Y, but not on the relative transverse coordinates here. And if these are arranged two by two by two, that will mean that there are six relative transverse coordinates. Now, in fact, what we're going to do is replace this structure, which is basically has toroidal directions, with a Calabi-Yau in those six, six directions. And if you may take the three harmonic functions to agree, so that, in fact, the M5 brains are coincident, then you can generalize the solution on the previous slide to a solution where the M5 brains are wrapping, wrapping three different two cycles on a Calabi-Yau threefold. So this, in fact, is an exact solution of 11-dimensional supergravity. Uh, in order to solve the, the form field equations in motion, the uh, <clears throat> I4 here has to be a harmonic function, and it'll be the dual in six dimensions of a two-form two harmonic function. So you can use the 1 comma 1 um, <clears throat> harmonics of the Calabi-Yau for that purpose. The difficult point in establishing consistency of such a solution, however, comes from the Einstein equation, where, um, in general, the problems with consistency is that if you try to, try to have a solution of this sort, uh, it's the quadratic terms on the right-hand side of the Einstein equation that will get you in trouble. And those quadratic terms normally would, would, would have functional dependence on the Calabi-Yau coordinates, which would require the presence of an infinite number of massive Kaluza-Klein modes on the left-hand side of the equation. However, in this specific case, uh, you find that if one requires that this I, I4 that's occurring here in the, in the form field ansatz has the property that it's squared is just a delta function and that it's symmetric in the six, six, six directions of the Calabi-Yau on some field line basis, then in fact you find that there's, there's, there's a unique solution that corresponds to that. And this is possible for this particular solution with the three equal harmonic functions um, if I4 is just the dual of the Kähler form of the Calabi-Yau, which is always there. So in fact, this particular solution actually is an exact 11-dimensional solution, although generic solutions of the time I'm, type I'm talking about are only approximate in the sense that we discussed with, uh, with Sergio. Yes? Yes, I'm not writing all the indices out, yes. Right. By localized? What do you mean? The, 
I'm talking about all the directions, the Calabi-Yau directions, right? So I'm just collect, I'm, I'm concerned only with the six directions of the Calabi-Yau. So we raise and lower with the metric on the Calabi-Yau. So I, I, if you're worried about this, I, I'm, I'm raised, I'm of course con contracting with the, the metric of the Calabi-Yau. So the point, In a, in a field bind basis, it would be a delta, a chronic or delta. In a field bind basis, it would. In a, this is the locally flat indices. No, it's not a delta function. It's a chronic or delta. Sorry, if that was the question. Yes, it means literally. That is just to avoid having the functional dependence on the calabi directions causing the left-hand side of the Einstein equations to, to spit out an infinite number of massive modes. Yes, so that's a chronic or delta, yes. OK, so that was for a generic calabi And this specific solution has this nice interpretation as, a, as an exact solution. Now I'm going to go to a, specific, uh, a special class of calabi which are elliptically fibered. And this is um, the work that I've been doing with uh, my student Tom Pugh and Thomas Grimm, and it relates also to earlier work of Bonetti and Grimm. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to specialize to an elliptically fibered space, and we're going to perform a T-duality on, the, on the, the toroidal fiber in order to interpret this uh, as a, an F-theory type solution in six dimensions. Uh, so now we're going to go back to the general um, five-dimensional effective theory, but specialize to uh, an elliptically fibered calabi So. Um, in that case, the, the uh, harmonic forms basically break up into three classes. Let the omega zero be associated to the elliptic fiber. Uh, omega alpha will be associated to the four-dimensional base. And then there will also, if this is a, uh, a singular calabi there will be blow-ups of the singularity resolutions that will also have their corresponding um, harmonic forms. Similarly, the vector multiplets, uh, the label can split up the labels into vectors A0, A alpha, and AI, and similarly for the scalar fields. Now, that also gives rise to some uh, restrictions on the intersection numbers of the, the calabi threefold, as given here. And now, with respect to this, the fields arrange themselves into multiplets of five-dimensional supersymmetry. And for example, together with the metric, the A0 vector form the bosonic part of the five-dimensional supergravity multiplet. Uh, the remaining vectors combine with the constrained scalars B in order to fo form uh, this number of, uh, of, of vector multiplets. And um, the remaining scalars form uh, hypermultiplets. So we end up with the following uh, general form of uh, a five-dimensional effective action for this, for this system. Uh, again, there's, there's a potential in the, in the five-dimensional theory. Everything is, all of these terms are in fact determined by various derivatives of this functional of the scalar fields, which are now generically called M. And, uh, it, and the, the, all the terms in the, in the action involve N and its derivatives. The value of N at the end is, is set equal to 1. Uh, and that's the form of the five-dimensional theory. Now, <clears throat> the T2 fiber of this elliptically fibered uh, construction allows us to reinterpret the five-dimensional system as, in fact, a dimensional reduction of a six-dimensional system, so we can pull it up or oxidize it to six dimensions. And what we lift into is, in fact, a 1, 0, six-dimensional supergravity uh, with gauged matter. So it's the matter, the, 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 the gaugings are, in fact, all from the vectors of the matter multiplet. So it's not actually a gauged supergravity in the sense of uh, uh, dewitt nikolai theory, where the gaugings are actually of the vectors in the supergravity multiplet. It's rather gaugings of the, the matter multiplet. Uh, now, because this is a 1, 0 theory, you have the problem of dealing with um, self-dual three forms in, in the theory. And there are various uh, attitudes that one can take to that. The simplest one is to consider what one can call a pseudo-action, which is merely an action that you vary to develop equations of motion, and then you impose the equations of motion, excuse me, you impose the uh, self-duality condition afterwards. Yeah? Class by? Uh, it does, yeah, by, by it, yes, 
But, I mean, everybody has the problem of what to do with the action. There's another, there's the, the uh, Padova attitude towards this type of action, which is to introduce auxiliary fields as another approach if you want to work with it Lorentz covariantly, or you can, you can treat it a, a la John Schwartz and uh, Teitelboim and Henault, as you know very well. But you always, you have a problem that the one comma zero theories contain a self-dual um, three-form field string, and so you have to, you have to deal with that. Okay, so you have a certain number of tensor multiplets, hypermultiplets, and you have a gauge group G in this generic theory. So the, the program, which was carried out by Bonetti and Grimm, is basically to start with this general six-dimensional one comma zero theory, dimensionally reduce it to five dimensions, and compare it to the five-dimensional theory on the previous slide. So I'm not going to go through um, the details of that. Let me just, I've just here s summarized the, the content of the various multiplets. So we have a self-dual form in uh, the uh, supergravity multiplet. You ha can have tensor multiplets with anti s with whose, whose two forms produce anti-self-dual three-form field strengths, and corresponding chirality and anti-chirality conditions on the spinners. Uh, here I've said that you basically have a choice of, of, of ways of, of swallowing the pill of the self-duality conditions, either with the pseudo-action or a non-Lorentz covariant procedure, as uh, John Schwartz or Heno and Teitelboim, or the Pasti, Sorokin, and Tonin uh, approach. Um, the six-dimensional theories are generically anomalous, and uh, if one wants to take this serious as a quantum theory, you have to uh, consider various constraints on the matter content. For suitable matter content, the anomaly polynomial factorizes, and then what remains of the anomalies can actually be removed by generalization of the Green-Schwartz mechanism, in which particular Augusto's uh, work played a rather uh, crucial role. Uh, for the present time, however, um, we're going to consider this mainly at a, at a semi-classical level. And what I want to consider now is, is the relation to uh, F-theory. So if we consider a, a, a generic M-theory reduction on a, on a product manifold of T2 times some Kähler manifold base of complex dimension 2, and then a five-dimensional um, Poincaré invariant subspace. Uh, first of all, one can write the fiber metric in the following form, with uh, parametrized by uh, tau parameter, and with an overall volume V. So the coordinates xA and xB here are taken to have period 1, and they will parametrize two cycles, the A cycle and the B cycle of the torus. Now, if we compactify along the A cycle, for example, starting from 11 dimensions, as we've written here, then, of course, we obtain the type 2A theory in 10 dimensions. On the B cycle, one can apply t-duality. And if you combine the t-duality on, on, on the B cycle with the reduction on the A cycle, then <coughs> the 11 to 10 reduction yields a type 2B theory in 10 dimensions, where the circle here corresponds to the B cycle. Now, what's called the F-theory limit is a limit in which the volume, which was called V0 on the previous slide, the overall volume of the fiber uh, is taken to zero, and the resolution blow-up volume uh, vanishes as well. But the overall Calabi-Yau threefold volume remains finite. Um, the size of the <coughs> t-dualized compact B-cycle uh, S1 in this limit is going inverse to the size of the, the, uh, the, the pre-t-dualized pre cycle. So instead of going to zero, it becomes infinite. This leads effectively to a type 2B theory on an M prime 10 dimensional space. Instead of reducing to nine dimensions, as you might think, from reducing from 11 on a two, two torus to nine, you actually re, re blow up one of the dimensions and you get another 10 dimensional theory, which is basically the two dimensional, two complex dimensional base times the six dimensional um, R15. So <clears throat> in this fashion, the T dualized B cycle has become de decompactified. And it's in that sense that we're going to look at a six-dimensional theory where we're going to try to find the brain solution. Uh, on an elliptically fibered calabi the same, exactly the same t-duality can be carried out fiber by fiber by fiber. The, the moduli of the two torus are going to depend holomorphically on the complex coordinates of the base manifold. And since the complex structure modulus tau yields the dilaton axion system of type 2b theory, what one ends up with is a non-trivial dilaton axon, axion profile varying as you, as you move along the base. But basically, the, the mechanics of, uh, of the reduction are 
the same as you have for an ordinary flat reduction. So the bosonic sector of the six dimensional theory will have a pseudo action uh, that again, that's this is taking the point of view that you simply write down an action and impose self duality constraints afterwards. Uh, it has this general form. Uh, I'm not going to go through all, all the terms here. The Q's here are hypermultiplets. And note that there's a six dimensional potential, as is natural since you're lifting it from a five dimensional theory with a potential. Uh, for the number of tensor multiplets, there's an SO, uh, SONT, comma, one. Uh, uh, duality symmetry for the tensor multiplets. There's a gauge group G. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so that's the, uh, the general form of the six dimensional theory. And as in five dimensions, the uh, scalar potential of that six dimensional theory has the consequence that this theory doesn't admit a maximally symmetric solution. But as in five dimensions, it has a rather an affinity for brain solutions. So one heads out to try to look for brain solutions and tries a three brain ansatz now of co-dimension two. So these, instead of co-dimension one, we have two coordinates, y a, a equals one and two. And we have to, of course, then, then there's an analysis of the full theory on the previous slide. For the scalars, it turns out that you can set all but two of them to constants and forget about them. The two remaining ones are going to sense this six dimensional potential which basically has runaway type solutions, and so you can't set the, those two scalars to, to constants. However, one finds that the Einstein equation in, in, the, in the T2 directions requires a link between those two scalars called phi and, again, V, which is precisely the, the volume of the, of the Calabial. So <clears throat> it leaves just one scalar V to determine the solution. And then if you look for supersymmetry, use the killing spinner equation to ensure an unbroken supersymmetry, you find a six-dimensional solution with the following form for the scalar v of quadratic structure. Okay, and indeed this r squared is a function of the transverse coordinate z for some integration constants, a, b, and c. So that can now, you can look for a comparison of that to the solution that we had in the heterotic M theory in five, five dimensions. Uh, in general, the five-dimensional theory will not have this sort of structure with the, the quadratic form that I just gave. But you have to remember that we can only hope for a link between the five- and six-dimensional theories if you take this elliptically fibered um, structure and, uh, and the re corresponding restrictions on the intersection numbers. In making the link between the five- and six-dimensional solutions, it's also necessarily to, necessary to take into account certain rescalings of the scalar fields uh, in the F theory limit. Remember that we're taking the overall volume of the torus to zero uh, with the Adulai cycle uh, blowing up. And correspondingly, you have to rescale the some scalar fields. When you do that, you find, and this is the notation of my original five-dimensional solution. This is basically the main technical result that we have, that one actually makes a link between the six-dimensional solution and the five-dimensional brain solution. So this is using all the volume and, uh, and shape moduli of the, of the five-dimensional theory. Now, what are the properties of that solution? Well, again, as the five-dimensional solution had, it has singularities where the, the V moduli, where the V scalar field goes through zero. Uh, if you, you can adjust the constants here to place one of these at, at uh, Z equals zero and write the V field in this form. In fact, it's a quadratic expression, Z times P minus Z. There's a certain geodesic distance here given by the other integration constant p. And uh, so in fact, this is a natural solution that has two singularities. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in order to, to understand a little bit better what the, um, the structure of this solution is, let's change coordinates from the coordinates that we just used to a, the two, and this is just a change of coordinates in the two two extra dimensions, the two dimensions on top of four to make six. So we have a z and a phi coordinate here, which are translated now into theta and phi. And um, here, in fact, are the, uh, the resulting, uh, the, the solution translated now into the, into the new coordinates. And you can see the singularity structure now Emerging, if you look at the, this uh, 
factor called omega here. In fact, we go from zero to zero as we go across a natural, it, this thing naturally compactifies itself into a kind of an orbifold direction. We didn't ask it to, but it, that's just what happens. Now, you take the six-dimensional theory and solve for it, and it has natural sort of orzhava witten type structure. Uh, correspondingly, if you look at the Ricci scalar in the two dimensions, you find that it blows up at the ends. Now, um, of course, in, in the five-dimensional theory, we also wanted to, uh, there were possibilities of running into uh, a zero, zero volume situation. And um, what we did there was basically to put those end brain sources into the original five-dimensional action uh, in order to inject charges, and that interprets what's happening at the ends. So if we do the same thing here, but now that we see what we basically have is Poincaré invariance three plus one dimensions, so that's a four-dimensional world volume. Let's put a four-dimensional brain source into the, into, the, into the action and recompute. So in fact, this should be moved, moved slightly away from z equals zero in order to move the resulting delta function term slightly into the interior of the interval. And then you find, in fact, the following expression, quadratic expression for the, for the scalar field z, where, where the q of the source uh, action now appears. And in fact, this now allows you to in, make an interpretation between the generic parameters that we had before and the source charge q. So in fact, this is naturally a solution with, uh, with charged brains at the end. One thing that's uh, rather puzzling about this is how did we manage to get a solution by just inserting four-dimensional world volume source actions with co-dimension two, therefore, into a six-dimensional theory? How is it that this is related to the five-dimensional solution that's co-dimension one? You would have thought that if you take the five-dimensional solution and, and lift it on a circle to six dimensions, what you'll end up with is the kind of smeared system of brains smeared in the transverse directions, which uh, in, a, in a paper back in the 90s with Hong Lu and Chris Pope, we called the reduction would be vertical dimensional reduction, or reduction in the transverse space, as opposed to reduction on the world volume. So it's not simply a wrapping of the brain. It's rather a stacking of brains like a, st like a deck of cards. You would have thought that that's what you obtain by lifting a five-dimensional solution to six dimensions, so that, in fact, what you really should have in, in six dimensions is a stack of three brains. But instead, what we put was really just a four-dimensional world volume source, and it rather naturally produced the same, the, this, this solution that can be interpreted uh, as, a, as a lifting of the five-dimensional one. So what seems to have happened is the F-theory construction. Uh, it seems to be a genuinely co-dimension two solution because the cycle on which you lifted the five-dimensional di five solution into six, that is the A cycle, was then T we had the T-dualization, and we shrank that cycle down to zero size. Meanwhile, another direction opened up, which is not one of the original transverse directions. So in that sense, it looks like we've actually generated a, gen a genuine co-dimension two brain. And that, I think, is one of the interesting aspects of this story. It is <coughs> now an opening to co-dimension two type structures in super supergravity. So I'm basically uh, going to finish up here with a couple of open questions. Um, this, because the, it has a non-trivial dilaton ax axion sector in this, this solution, it's clearly associated to type 2b7 brains. And indeed, these um, singularity resolutions in the, in the uh, Calabi out threefold are, are known to be associated to seven brains. Um, the seven brains are also co-dimension 2. And as we know in type 2b theory in uh, in 10 dimensions, there's a quantize, there are direct quantization conditions for co-dimension two brains. And the uh, duality symmetry of, of that system, in fact, instead of being SL2R, discretizes to SL2Z. Uh, similarly, there should be uh, an SL2Z structure in the six-dimensional system that uh, we're talking about. But we haven't worked that out. If I come back to the first part of the talk, where I showed you that this particular universal three-brain solution of the, of the M-theory was actually an exact solution of M-theory, which can be interpreted as three intersecting M5 brains. One can ask now, what is the relationship between that and this F-theory construction um, 
that I've just presented here. And finally, with a view towards cosmological applications, one can ask what, if we now look at this six-dimensional type of theory more generally, is there additional freedom uh, in these three brain types of solutions that could be of use in cosmological applications? So thanks for your attention. Sorry, what did the? Well, of course, that's an inter uh, just an interpretation of the bulk. Um, that's an interpretation of the bulk bulk solution, right? You're using Arcadi's intersecting brain um, formalism. So you have you end up with codimension one simply because you um, on top of four. You have seven dimensions, one of which is co-dimension one, and then six of which are, are relative transverse dimensions. Essentially, there's a stack, again, in the relative transverse directions. Um, so once you have co-dimension one, your harmonic function is just a linear function. And then in, in order to avoid running into the, the zero potential, or, or zero, uh, zero harmonic function situation, you put a kink. So the, the, the brains are, back, are basically injected into the solution as additional boundary um, terms. So how you want to interpret that in terms of sources of M5 brains, um, I'm not quite sure. One basically has to smear around M5 brains in order to do that. You have gauge theory supported on the boundaries. Yes. Did you? Well, now, so now you're trying to, t you're t in, the, in the Horzawa Witten picture, of course, one um, looks for, for canceling anomalies. And uh, indeed, you can do this originally in the 10-dimensional uh, picture, horzawa witten picture, where you find, in fact you find the 8 cross 8. Or if you want to look in the heterotic M-theory picture, you can actually do this in the four-dimensional context, four being the world volume of the five-dimensional theory that I was talking about. And there, actually, you do have anomalies. They're rather weak anomalies in the sense that they, they, the conditions that they impose, they're they're off-diagonal, mixed anomalies, mixed gravitational gauge anomalies. And we looked at this with uh, Andre Lucas. And in fact, you do get a rather uh, general set of conditions on the type of matter that would be uh, existing on the, on the end brains. So indeed, that's, I could add that to another open question of the, uh, the types of end, end brain matter. Uh, because you have all of this, the, the difficulty of canceling anomalies in six dimensions, surely there uh, is exactly uh, such a structure that one needs to look at here. Um, yes, uh, just a misunderstanding. The negative tension brain, is it in the middle of your interval? Or it's at the end. In the end, okay, so it's not, its position is non-dynamical. Right? I mean, there is no, you are not free to move it around without uh, deforming the space. So it's, it's like a Hojava uh, I would say brain. Uh, there's an aspect of its position that is dynamical. In fact, that's another whole talk I could give. That, the width of that interval is not fixed. That, the width of that is dynamical, right? That negative tension brain, however, is at the end, right? So it's not going to move away from the end. But um, the, the width of the interval can change. Uh, basically, there are, there are two modes. There is an overall center of mass motion of the two brains together, and then there's a relative motion. They can do this, and they can do this, right? As you go, as you go along the world volume, OK? So both of those modes are possible. So actually, if you hold the positive tension brain fixed, then you have a series of, of motions of the, left, of, the, of the negative tension brain alone. And in principle, you should worry about whether that produces uh, instability. The answer is it doesn't. And the thing that saves you is actually supersymmetry. We looked at this basically using an ADM-type construction for the, for the energy and found that when you try moving the negative tension brain, the negative tension brain says, hey, this is fun. As I get larger, I can lose energy. That's true. But it also stretches the space-time in a way which overcompensates. So actually deviating it, in fact, overall raises the energy, and it ends up being stable.
uh, obviously that, that it's too early to have started to look at the cosmological applications. Those are interesting. One of the I can't answer you right away, but there's certainly something to add as yet another interesting question about that. Yeah. I, one aspect of this that I find interesting is the fact that the the, the intersecting three M5 brain solution is an exact solution of 11 dimensions, and that could have uh, importance also perhaps in cosmology, in the sense that basically what's ha what that means is no matter how violently the brain is moving, it is lacking uh, basically single quantum uh, interactions with the heavy modes. So, the, so the, the brain can move around quite violently without starting the heavy modes moving. It can cause pair creation of heavy modes, but it will not create single quantum interactions with the heavy modes. Very light modes in the, in the near static approximation when you are looking at the configuration where the two brains mm -hmm. are very near to each other, what is the widest uh, spectrum of modes? Is it 3D right. or is it particle light? Um, that, that should be a question that can be addressed yeah, without. Yeah, in fact, that's uh, a very cosmology. good question, and uh, okay. certainly should look at that. Uh, 